About 10 years ago, I was on book tour for Radical Acceptance. And one question came up more than any other question, and I really want to focus tonight on that question. And it was, how do we accept something that really seems uh, harmful? How do we accept something that maybe that we're doing that seems harmful? If, say, we're um, addicted to alcohol or drugs and we're ruining our body and our life and so on, how do we accept that? Or how do we accept when somebody else is being uh, harmful, is being emotionally abusive to us or physically abusive to us? How do we accept that? Or how do we accept uh, things that happen in terms of uh, social injustice or policies of our country that we know might lead to more suffering, more aggression in the world? How do we accept those things? Is it good to accept? And then the question is really, does acceptance sabotage the possibility of constructive change? Now, that's the inquiry, and, and really, uh, n it was the number one question, and it's still the question I get the most on acceptance. <laughs> so, um, what I'd like to do is explore a very simple yet basic principle that is incredibly challenging in practice to to work with, and yet. Um, there's truth to it, and that is only by radical acceptance, and what I mean by that is fully allowing life to be as it is in this moment, okay, radical acceptance, um, is genuine transformation even possible? It's like everything we're worried about, our own behaviors, others' behaviors, the world, it's through radical acceptance, this moment opening our being to the reality of what is and allowing it to be just as it is in this moment, do we contact the inner resources, our own mindfulness and compassion in a way that allows us to then respond and not react to the world? So it's the, uh, it's the necessary first ingredient to being able to bring about genuine change. Acceptance isn't passive. So I want to explore that and um, really explore how the starting place of all real healing is when in some way we're encountering something difficult in ourselves, and we say yes to it. And by yes, I mean we give it permission to be there in that moment or we encounter somebody else that's treating us in a certain way, and on some level we're saying yes, meaning not I like this, not I want you to continue this, but I completely give permission this moment that this is how this is. I acknowledge it. I get the actuality of it. So that's the nutshell summary of the talk. Uh, you know, I'm titling it The Freedom of Yes. And I'll, I'll mostly be applying it to, you know, how we can respond to ourselves and each other from this wisdom. And I'd like to begin uh, with, a, with a story that struck me. I heard it some years ago, Lester Levinson, and he's the, the founder of the Sedona Method. And when Lester was in his 40s, he became really, really sick. And just almost every part of his body was failing in some way. He had um, congestive heart failure and I think colon cancer and so on. Well, his doctors basically told him to go home and not move much and there was nothing they could do. And if he moved much, he'd set off a heart attack. So that was it. He was in his 40s and on his way out. It was a death sentence. Now, Lester was incredibly educated in many degrees. Um, it studied all different philosophies and this is where it landed him. So it made him kind of say, okay, drop it all. Drop all my ideas about how things are and let me really look more closely. And so what he did was he asked the place of disease in him, the, the places where his body was really in failure, what is your view of the world? And what he found, 
this is across the board, was the view was a demand that things be different. That his way of moving through life was life isn't the way it should be. I'm not the way I should be. You're not the way you should be. Life, and there was this constant demand that things be different. Now what Lester was discovering was really the basic truth that the Buddha had put forward 2,500 some years earlier, which is that our suffering comes in any moment that we want things different. Any moment that we reject what's happening here, that we say no. This is what he was finding. So for him, this, this kind of lit him up and he realized he hadn't gotten very far with all his other bright ideas, so he did this three-month uh, sadhana, that's what I call it, it's a, it's a kind of a training, where whenever he would recognize that, that no in him, that demand to be different, he would pause and he'd just let go of that demand and then open to how it was. And in that letting go and opening, um, he healed. And he healed so much that, uh, let's see, it was, he was healthy for 42 more years, okay? He healed himself. And he developed the Sedona method, which is a very powerful tool, please look into it, for challenging beliefs and for, uh, you know, really empowering yourself, letting go of limiting beliefs. Now, the core limiting belief that gets us in trouble is that something is wrong. And that doesn't mean that we don't take the signal when there's pain that we need to do something, but there's a belief in wrongness, in badness, that something should be different. Should is, as I, I say often, your flag. It, pause when you, when you get this thing that you shouldn't be like this or I shouldn't be like this. Um, it's this belief that something's wrong that's behind all the different ways that we go to war against ourselves or that we deny things or that we avoid things or that we hide. Now, it's a matter of degree. I mean, we carry it around to different degrees, each of us. I mean, for many of us, there's, there's seasons or parts of each day where we might not be in the sense of, um, thank you for everything, this is perfect, I could die this moment. I mean, that might not be what's going on. There might be some sense of, wish, want this, this is uncomfortable, that kind of thing. But we're not really in the grip of, this is wrong something's wrong. And, and during those moments we still have some access to what we might call our ma more mature or evolved or true nature. We have access to our humor. You know, we still have access to a wider perspective. We have access to our hearts. We're what I consider fundamentally more flexible. And by that I mean something comes up, we have a few different options on how we respond, okay? And we all know that we have a kind of a, a toleration point and when we go past that comfort level, we go past our zone of toleration, um, we go into reactivity and we no longer have access. That's when we're in the no, that's when we're in the something's wrong. When we're past our toleration point, it feels like something's wrong with this and we're in reactivity, we're no longer able to respond. There's a kind of rigidity that sets in. So if we paid attention and really watched, we'd see all the ways that we're saying no at those times. And it's really interesting, and I'm gonna ask you to pick, of course, an area where you know you go past your, this is tolerable point and, and examine some. But when, we, when, when we're in that, our body's constricted, we're in fight flight physically, our mind either speeds up or freezes, there's usually some, in the content of the mind is usually judgment or blame or, or kind of a panicking, uh, you know, a frenzied planning. There's a rigidity. We no longer can attune to how to respond best to move things in a way that's healing. We're in reaction, we're in the grip of a very old conditioning. And then we react in a way that is very, very familiar and creates 
all the same conditions for the to rehappen and rehappen. And then we wonder why our lives are running through similar patterning. So we're talking tonight really about the tendency to get caught in that uh, looping of something's wrong and saying no to how it is. And it's very much a part of the design of our survival brain. So don't take it personally if you're thinking, yeah, I go into that a lot. It, we all are rigged that way. In fact, we all are rigged, as I've mentioned this, we have a bias towards the negative. When something unpleasant happens early in our life, we, for the sake of survival, we fixate on it, we remember it, it imprints, we look for the same thing happening again. You know, it's the Velcro for bad stuff, Teflon for good stuff thing. It's really the way our brain works, you know. So that, that's part of it. And, you know, it's got a feeling of life as a problem to be solved. It's, that's the, it's like we're trying to make it through the day when we're in that. And as I mentioned, there's degrees. We're not always in the complete re rigid reactivity, but there's degrees. But there is a sense that something's wrong that kind of bleeds through everything. So then you get the, you know, cartoons like one with the two, two Jewish mothers sitting on a park bench and one saying, oi. And the other responds, oi. And then the first one says, all right, enough about the children. <laughs> <You know. laughs> but you get the idea. I mean, it's... So sometimes the bias is where we sense uh, that something is wrong with you and some people are rigged that that's where it goes right away, that something's wrong and it goes like an outward, an outward kind of blaming. And um, I thought I'd share with you because we're consistent through our lives. People that blame when they're young tend to blame when they're old unless they start meditating, you know. And so I was reading this book and I have no idea where I got it. It's called Famous Last Words. <laughs> so I thought I'd give you some examples. So this is the bias with uh, something is wrong with you. And the famous last words of Ramon Maria Narvaez, a Spanish general and political leader. Uh, and he was asked by a priest on his deathbed whether he forgave his enemies. This is his response. I do not have to forgive my enemies. I have had them all shot. <laughs> <laughs> True. Last words. <laughs> Can you imagine those are your last words? <laughs> it does not forebode well. Okay. So, and then, as we know, for many of us, this negative bias fixates on me. Something's wrong with me. And that's, that's our filter. You know, whatever's going on, in some way it lands. This is an indicator of I'm bad and I'm wrong. And, um, you know, we might get a mess of compliments for a job that we did. One person gives a kind of disgruntled complaint. That's all we remember, you know, really. So, uh, example number two, this is the last words of Leonardo da Vinci, artist, inventor, all-around Renaissance man. He said, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. So if you're feeling bad about how you're doing, <laughs> I thought that was kind of a gift, you know. <laughs> you know, how, how we live today, they say, is how we live our life. So these biases, you know, we just keep using the same filter. I thought I'd share one more. I'm not sure how quite where it fits, but this was an um, English adventurer. His name's Alexander Blackwell. He's about to be executed and he laid his head on the wrong side of the block, and this is what he said. I'm sorry for the mistake, but this is the first time that I've been beheaded. <laughs> so when I'm talking about a negative bias, sorting for what's wrong, it's really a version of saying no, and it's very much but it, we each have different degrees of it and it's very much exacerbated by our genetics, as you might imagine, and our culture and, and also very much our personal history. And uh, to the degree that we had severed belonging, is the way I put it, you know, psychology calls it poor attachment bonding. To the degree there was not attunement and resonance, 
um, in our early years, our very, very early years, to the degree we might have been neglected or abused. Uh, to, to that degree, there's a stronger bias towards the negative, towards something's wrong, towards no, towards the body having no, the mind having no, the heart being tight. So a story, and I'll, and I'll carry this through tonight, some of a, one woman I worked with, her, her, she was the middle child, I was going to say the middle child of four, and I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> so you can figure it out, but she was either second or third. Her mom was uh, very stressed and preoccupied, and, and she, would, uh, she would be very unresponsive and then unpredictably uh, lash out with anger when this, when this woman was a little girl and wanted her attention. And so she grew up, as she discovered in therapy, with the belief that my needs are bad, I shouldn't have them, and they'll evoke a negative reaction, a kind of yuck response or an angry response. That was her feeling. You know, needy, neediness is a, shame, is a shameful thing. And she also kind of got the message that my hurt and anger about not getting my needs met is bad, so my emotions are bad. I'm basically too sensitive, and I should be different. And so, as an adult, she kind of would hide her needs, but then they would pop out in anger. So she would la find herself lashing out at her three-year-old daughter. That was what want, brought her to want to explore this. Um, but also, she felt very, she was having a real sense of distance from her partner and felt very much neglected by her partner. So her history was repeating, okay? And her experience of history was this, of her situation was a big no. This is bad, I am bad, my husband is bad, the way that I end up satisfying my unmet needs through overeating is bad. You know, it was like kind of everywhere she was paying attention, it was uh, bad. So you might consider, this is a friend of yours, she comes to you, she tells you, you know, I've always been this way. I don't know if this is, you know, could ever change. And you know something about meditation and you wonder, well, so how might she practice in a way that could take that deeply ingrained reflex of no, I'm bad, you're bad, this is bad, and begin to create a little more space because there was a lot of, there's a lot of rigidity. So, I sometimes in my mind go back to, I, I think contemporary science has really given us a gift of a way to mentally hold this that actually gives hope. And neuroplasticity is the key word now, it's been out for about 20 years. In fact, most everything we know about neuroscience is the last 20 years, it's very new. And what we know is that any experience causes neurons to fire. And repeated experiences cause, like, mom's angry at me for pestering her and I am bad, causes neurons to fire repeatedly. And neurons that fire together wire together, which means that if we have repeated firing, it strengthens a neural connection and neural connections become neural pathways and networks, which means that after a certain amount of time, we have a pretty set-in, well-grooved neural patterning whereby we have the thoughts and the feelings of, I'm too needy, I'm bad, I shouldn't be this way, and you shouldn't be this way for making me feel bad. You know, it's all set in. Now the good news is, because we usually think, oh God, it's so deeply grooved, how will I ever change it? You know, and the good news is we, have a capacity to come into presence and actually uh, have a new kind of neural firing that creates new pathways. And what is conditioned can be deconditioned. So, I come back often to Viktor Frankl's phrase that between the stimulus and the response there is a space. And in that space is your power and your freedom. Because that is where there's hope. That it is possible, a historical feeling, a very, very familiar feeling comes up of that somebody doesn't like you or you're being judged and you feel that feeling. And it's possible rather than going into the tumbling forward of the thoughts and feelings and reactions that you would have, it's possible to train yourself to pause 
and in that pause to relate differently to what's going on. You can relate to it, not from it. And this is where the beginning of the shift from no to yes comes. It's in this pause. It's in this space. The deal is that we need to slow it all down. Uh, You know, it's not just a nice idea to slow down our lives. The embedded neuropathways that are causing trouble are part of our limbic system, activated through our limbic system, which is part of the fast thinking part of the brain. It goes instantly to its impressions, its conclusions, and its messages. If we want to access the higher centers of our brain that correlate to mindfulness and compassion, we have to slow down. Those are the parts of the brain that require kind of a deliberateness and an effort to be present. Have to pause. How would this look? So I'll read you one of my favorite poems by the poet Kaviri Patel. She's a wonderful poet. You might track her down. She writes, There's a monkey in my mind, swinging on a trapeze, reaching back to the past or leaning into the future, never standing still. Sometimes I want to kill that monkey, shoot it square between the eyes so I won't have to think anymore or feel the pain of worry. But today, I thanked her. And she jumped down straight into my lap, trapeze still swinging, as we sat still. Isn't that lovely? That we can have this familiar patterning of worry thoughts and instead of either believing them or being, you know, down on ourselves for being so neurotic, we can just pause in some way say thank you very much. And we have created a different form of firing and different neural firing. We're beginning a new pathway. And if we said to ourselves, you know, here's a thought I have a lot and it causes me trouble, I'm just going to have the intention to try to pause and remember and just say thank you, you know, rather than believe it. And, and if it happens one out of five times, we're actually, it's, it's a radical shift. That counts. Now, I'm giving you, that's a very simple example and it's a bit simplistic because if the no thought, if the pattern that we're trying to wake up from is really sticky, and you know what I mean by sticky patterns, right? Um, It's not so easy. The movement from um, all the whole swim of aversiveness we're in to thank you it's got some steps. You don't just all of a sudden flip into thank you. It's a different biochemistry almost. So there's, there's steps. And that's what I want to go through with you are the step. It's like, you know, getting to yes, you know, that book. Well, this, this really are, these are really the steps to really fully giving permission to this life to be as it is wholeheartedly. And we have to slow it down. So we'll just use RAIN, because RAIN is your basic template for, for mindfulness, that to prepare to recognize something, and this is where you might be considering in your own life, you know, where is a place that you know you go past the comfort zone, the tolerance zone, and you know you go over, and that's where you want to wake up. You identify it, and you do it in advance. This takes some premeditative deliberateness, okay? So you do it in advance. And um, then you say it may be, you know, something with your partner or some physical discomfort where you go over the edge or your child's behavior, but you set your intention to notice. So then it comes up and then you're able to say, okay, this was the one I flagged. So that's recognizing. Now the key juncture here is allowing. And for those of you that aren't familiar with RAIN, RAIN is an acronym and it goes recognize, allow, investigate with kindness. Bring an investigation and a kindness to what's there. And in that process, the N is the freedom. It's not identified. No longer caught up in that fearful self or angry self. We're we're back to our natural awareness. 
natural compassion. So the R is recognized, and we've just talked about that. A is where I want to spend time, because the A is where we begin to sense the possibility of really giving permission to our life. And it starts with a pause. When we've recognized what's going on, we need to pause, and you can intuit how come that, that, you, that when we're in reactivity, it's like we're tumbling into the future. The metaphor I like to use is we're on a bicycle and we're pedaling away from the present moment and we do it faster and faster when we're upset. Our mind goes faster and our body tightens up and everything speeds up. To come into presence and begin to learn to say yes, we need to stop pedaling. Just stop. So there's something in you going to say gently and firmly, just stop. It's a gift, okay? So, so we stop and, and we get, we understand that that's the thing to do. I mean, I, I suspect every one of you can, can sense from your own wisdom that, that stopping is so important because that's where the space opens up that gives us our power and our freedom. So we stop. And then you know, we've decided on recognizing the pattern, we've paused, then the pausing deepens into allowing. And here's kind of how. First of all, we have the intention to allow. We already know that being at war with our experience doesn't serve. So there's a sense that we want to say yes, but as so many people have reported, when it's a strong and painful feeling, it's almost like we're going through the motions. We're saying, okay, allow, I'll let it be here. But there's another part of us that's just waiting for it to go away, right? I mean, isn't that true? We don't like it. So how do we deepen the allowing? And I'd like to give you some, what I think of as practice tips on how allowing can become genuine, okay? From just perfunctory, okay? So the first thing is that when you arrive in the pause, take a moment to establish presence. Take some long, deep breaths. Long, deep breaths, and this you've, you probably, when you were a child, you know, take three long, deep breaths before you say da 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 to your sister, you know, whatever. Long, deep breaths stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. They help to chill out the sympathetic nervous system, fight flight. So just a few deep breaths will actually alter your state some so that you have more chance at allowing. Okay. The other things that are helpful, especially if you're, um, if it's, there's a lot of anxiety, is grounding yourself. In other words, just as you're sitting here, just feel, you might close your eyes and feel the pressure of your feet on the floor. Have them flat on the floor so you can really feel them, that you're touching the floor and the earth. You might feel the pressure of your bottom on your seat. And sense the earth beneath you, sense yourself supported, sense gravity, that's grounding. And then you can more arrive in a pause by just being aware of your senses and just noticing, and here's where you open your eyes, just notice what's around you. Notice sounds, color, form. So you establish a quality of hearness and that makes it a lot, it creates an atmosphere that's much more conducive to true allowing. Now the next tip is to start saying yes to what's actually here. And you might find that there's a lot of different currents going on. So at first you might be just saying, okay, um, yes to this anxiety and yes to these worry thoughts and yes to this heart pounding and you might just be noticing yes to this embarrassment that I'm getting, I'm caught in this right now. You know, yes to my anger at that person. So there may be a number of things and in a way you're saying this too, oh yeah, and this too, and this too. So you're kind of allowing the whole field of what's here because it's not like when we're in reactivity that there's always just one thing, right? Does that make sense? She, so these are some tips to have the pause become an authentic allowing. A few long deep breaths, grounding yourself, including all the different elements that are here right now. 
Now let's say one of those elements is so big, like let's say it's really strong fear, that another element is absolute aversion and not wanting to be with it and not wanting to allow it. This is where we get to the real point, okay? What if you hit something that you're saying this too and this too and this too and everything in you says, no, not this. You know, this is the thing. This is the one thing. I do not want to feel this. It's too raw, it's too deep, it's too much. The this too is a way of saying yes to your no. And please remember this, that you can say yes to your no. In fact, that might be the end of your session, so to speak that you agree with your no, you say yes to your no, no, okay. Not, to, not going to be with this. You're saying yes to the experience of not wanting it. You're even agreeing to not go further. That's okay. There's a power to recognizing and saying yes to your no. It creates some space too. You're a little more present. You're a little less identified. I'm just looking around. Does that resonate for you? Okay. I bring this up because there's times that the aversion to what we're experiencing is so great that by forcing us to ex- ourselves to experience it, we're not, that's not allowing. By even agreeing to let it be there, all we can do is agree to the feeling that we don't want it to be there. So try to be on that one. I, I, I say this because for many of us we have a lot of trauma locked in our bodies. And when we're asked to say yes to the trauma, it feels like too much. And it's incredibly compassionate to sense the too much and say yes to that feeling. 